Hey everybody, welcome back again to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy where the proof is in the singing. I'm doing this really interesting series and the series is called Replacement Singers. Who did it better? Next up is Vince Neil and John Karabi. You know the band is Motley Crue. Before we get started, if you wouldn't mind, please like and subscribe to my channel. That'd be really cool. Uh, I have a singing course for you guys that are interested in learning about singing. You're already a singer or even an advanced singer. Uh, it takes you all the way to the highest levels and starts at the very, very basics. You can find it right here at KenTamplinVocalAcademy.com. It's called How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else. I also have a free singing forum with about 25,000 singers over there all negotiating, discussing these great singers and how to get great at singing. So I want to get dive right in. Now, um, we have some rules of engagement. I've covered this in a couple videos already, so I don't want to be redundant. But first of all, post respectfully um, in the comments. Please don't just, you know, say this guy sucks, he's this, whatever. It makes no sense to do that. I really want to get to the bottom of who's better. And sometimes things aren't always as they seem. So let's talk about Motley Crue right now because I think that um, if I were to say and base something only on singing abilities. Of course, in my opinion, John Karabi is a great singer, a much better, you know, technical singer, or even just a great, better singer uh, than Vince Neil. But let's not, you know, forget about things like chemistry of the band, who actually helped make the band famous initially, um, and lots of different elements that come in. And, and even down to the songwriting, um, I could tell you know, that you've got songwriting that's curtailed towards Vince Neil. When John Karabi went in the band, you know, we're going to discuss this in a minute. Um, you know, th again, things aren't as this seem. I don't want to have a spoiler alert on that. So let's dive right in. And uh, what rules of engagement, sorry, is is that, you know, who was in the band longer, who lasted longer, who helped write more, write more songs? Did the replacement singer take the band to a new level? Um, lots of questions that need to be answered in order to give a total picture or a total fair um, assessment of who did it better. Okay, so here we go. By the way, it's pretty cool that the girls are dancing and actually singing. So they have chicks that can sing uh, and also dance like that fun. Um, now, back here, we're going to talk about songwriting. Obviously, um, these songs were written specifically. And Nikki Six did a good chunk of the songwriting in the band. So he probably said, okay, this is what I have to work with. This is kind of the style I want to go after. And let me give you an example of something, and you guys may have not thought of this, okay? I just did, and I'm not sure when I'll release this, but I just did Dr. Feel Good with Sarah Loera. And as I was going through this, and I, I have a version myself, and I'll try to put whatever Motley Crue stuff I have in the description so you can check out how we did on stuff. But uh, anyway, I did, yeah, I did Dr. Feel Good, and I did um, Kickstart My Heart, so I'll put both those in there. But I, I um, bring it up because I remember singing this and the lyric reminded me so much of the verses to walk this way. You know, a Jimmy Cancer done a second hand hand and deals out of Hollywood. Got a 57 Chevy, prominent fames, trading for some powder goods, right? I said, hey, diddle diddle, put your kitty in the middle, let it swing like it didn't care. So I took a big chance at the high school dance with the missus who was ready to play, right? So I thought, wow. So I, <laughs> Nikki probably listened to Walk This Way, knew what he had to work with, with Vince, and did something in the verses similar to Aerosmith and was looking for an Aerosmith vibe. And then when you go back and listen to the song, Song, there's a lot of elements like that that make sense, right? So um, I say that because it's really obvious to me um, that he had a certain, I want to use the word limited range, but I can't be so politically correct, guys, to not just call things out. He had a limited range singer who just, it, it was what it was. And then this is what he wrote for. So this is the byproduct of that. But let's remember the chemistry of the band, and this is what helped make the band Famous, okay? So back in the LA scene, when you know, and this is the more polished stuff than the earlier stuff, um, which was really cool because they got better at this sound as they went along. Okay, so again, 
I've heard a lot of people bash on Vince. Um, and as, as in a similar fashion, maybe not as extreme as we talked about David Lee Roth, you know, back in the LA scene, a, a good chunk of why bands got famous was because of their fronting abilities and their charisma on stage, uh, how they fit the band, the motif, you know, did they synergize with the group well? And I'd have to say, yeah, I mean, he fit the whole Motley Crue thing. And, you know, whether it's looks that kill or this or whatever, the earlier stuff, it was that LA vibe scene. Rat was in that category. There's these other bands where I wouldn't say they're all the greatest singers. It just they they fit kind of what was going on, and this certainly is that. So uh, man, you know, and he pulled it off, and he's pulling it off live. Okay, now again, in fairness, I don't. I pulled footage, as I've said this a million times, on what publishing companies would allow. So I had to grab footage, and I like grabbing live footage because I really feel like you can really hear the singer rather than a bunch of you know extra takes behind a red light in the studio. So, but in this case, the vocals are pretty dicey. Check this out. Okay, so I wouldn't even really call that singing, okay? Girls, Girls, Girls was different. Now let's talk about this again because I'm talk about the songwriting. So Nikki Six was able to, such a great songwriter, was able to um, take what he had and work with it. Um, but he also was able to, uh, to mask and maybe hide some of his inability with the band and the prowess of the band and the strength of the songwriting and you know some Tommy's drumming. I mean, he's a great drummer. Like, yet yeah, there was a lot of strengths that he played off of in order to be able to mask or hide or or, or just cover for maybe some, some things that weren't so great. Now, this is obviously earlier on in the, in their career. I don't know if this is the Us Festival or what, but um, uh, you know, this was earlier on, and so they hadn't been as developed as that. Like, you know, this is back around the looks of Killer. I think maybe an earlier, but um, era. Now, if you listen to how raw and naked his vocals are, okay, uh, and then you listen to the production stuff on Girls, 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 or Dr. Feelgood, or something, there is a whole lot of production going on, <laughs> right? So it's very, very different than, you know, his, his voice is fairly weak here, and it's pretty small and kind of mousy sounding up top. Um, and I'm not here to bash on him, I'm just calling a spade a spade for what it is, but let's be realistic. Um, you know, the band and the recordings is much bigger than they are here live at this point, right? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Kind of done with that a little bit, so I'm gonna move up here. A little bit better than it used to be. See, this is, but let's go back. Let's check out Live Wire. Sorry, I should have done that. Here we go. This is one of the very first songs, right? Willing and free, a little bit better than it used to be. I mean, it just sounds like a pretty mediocre garage band, right? I mean, you'd go into a, like a LA rehearsal room and you'd be going, yeah, yeah, a bit, right? Okay, I want to fast forward a little bit um, to to this. Now, again, this is a studio recording, so it's not fair, but John Karabi's a great singer, so I, I want to point some things out as I get to that. But check this out. Okay, here's.
Okay, I want to get into this in a minute. Good song, by the way. Real good song. Um, this happened at the zenith of when 80s metal and classic rock took a complete nosedive and grunge was coming in, circa 1989, 1990, 1991. John Karabi steps in to fit or fill the shoes, so to foot the bill, fill the shoes um, of Vince Neil. It's, it's kind of like having Chris Cornell step into something. I mean, he's, he's really good. And then, but all of a sudden, some executive decisions are made on to the direction of the band because it was tragically unhip to continue on with the 80s metal sound. So lots of bands tried to change their sound, right? And I'm gonna give you an exception to this in just a second, a couple of exceptions. And so Motley Crue was no exception to this. They actually, you know, went that route. And what was interesting for me that I thought that Nicky did in songs like this was, I felt he did a really good job trying to marry their original, you know, girls, girls, girlsy, Dr. Feel Goody kind of sound and contemporize that sound with a bit of a grunge flair without going full blown grunge, okay? Because they really weren't that kind of band. You, you know, Tommy Lee on drums, for example, is just a killer, bad A drummer. You've got, you know, the whole band had risen finally, not finally, but they'd risen to, to, to a form of excellence that superseded, I think, eclipsed a lot of the grunge bands, not all, but you know, quite a bit. So it would have been kind of weird to putting a square peg into a round hole to try to get them to, to be full-blown grunge, okay? Now, so Karabi steps into the situation with the best that he could, and I think it's really good, like the album's really good, and this is a really good song, and he's a really good singer, it's a good band, good production. But at that time, the Molly Crew fans didn't want to hear grunge. They wanted to hear Motley Crue. And it may or may not have been smarter, again, who knows, at that juncture where, again, commercial music or uh, uh, 80s metal just crashed, to have done another album in the spirit of original Motley Crue and not got down the gr grunge route. But it was an executive decision, a smart one, a business one that Nicky made um, to do that in the songwriting part. Now, why do I bring this up? Because <clears throat> there were, Quite a few bands that did this, and interestingly enough, if I think of, I mentioned Chris Cornell, if I think of Chris Cornell as a singer, and even Lane Staley could fit in this category too, I think that he could have easily been an 80s metal singer and jumped into the boat of the modern rock group of you know bands or whatever and was very successful through that time uh doing just that but he certainly has more of the high range and the distortion and the power and and some of the blues not all because it's like he kind of shied away from that uh so that he wasn't stigmatized or tagged as a as a 80s metal you know uh rock singer but he could have certainly fit that bill and and so karabi in the same way you know, it was kind of straddling both fences. But they made this decision and it wasn't that successful. So then do we say who was better, you know? By the way, let me, okay, let me finish playing the song and then we'll get to that, hold on. Cause I'm gonna get back to other bands. See on the da 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 da, we think of you know he's the one to call or not. We think of um, uh, kickstart Mahara, ba da 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 da, right? It's the same lit kind of, and so there's certain L, but then there's the detuning of the guitars. There's he brings in elements of Motley Crue and he brings elements of grunge without being too grungy, so he doesn't totally lose everybody. He's got a, a, a really commercial, um, very poppy commercial sounding '80s metal kind of bit going on here, where the verses were much more modern rock grunge kind of, say more to modern rock than grunge and interesting hey, hooligans holiday See, you know, I, I could I could see you know Lane Staley singing something like this if it was a little more dark and minor key and you know whatever, uh, not being so commercial in that sense. And maybe if they'd really gone down that route and stuck to it for a while, it may have worked. Now back to other bands. So I got the privilege through these times of traveling back and forth to Europe on tour, a lot of different tours and stuff. This is about 1989, 90, and I watched 
When Bon Jovi kind of took a huge dump in the United States around that time, and a lot of other bands that had done that, what and Sammy Hagar even, you know, to some extent, you know, the, the pre Van Halen, and then Van Halen came in and they sort of stuck to their guns. But um, what was interesting is the bands that actually stuck to their guns at that time, which would include, um, you know, bands like Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi went back to their roots where they became famous initially, went back to Europe and worked their tails off in order to be able to, to you know, to hang on to what was kind of going away, you know, fading, and, um, and maintain that and rebuild their careers with their original sound. Now, did John change some things around with Layer Hands of Me and some other stuff? Yes and no, he started to lose some range and stuff and he accommodated that, you know, uh, whatever. But for the most part, you know, he stayed true to that. Now, that was true for other bands like ACDC, Van Halen, you know, a lot of other groups that went back to their original roots, didn't kind of veer off to do, you know, the grungy sort of thing, um, and just went back to work and regained their fans and tried to, you know, get, get whatever back. They stayed the course and they became or continued to be successful. I just find that really interesting. Now, Motley Crue, I'm sure, is coming back and they'll do Motley Crue. Um, they're gonna be touring again and playing their old stuff, and I'm sure they'll come up, come up with something new. But so it begs the question, and this is really an enigma because most people would say, well, Vince Neil must have been better because he maintained it, he's back in the band, people wanna hear the original singer. I get all that. But the reality is, in my personal opinion, Karabi's a much better singer, and I think most all of us would agree. I think Vince would agree with that. But the chemistry and the songwriting, we had a criteria. Do you remember what that was? The criteria was, did the replacement singer take the band up a notch? I don't know, was that song better than Girls, 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 or was that song better than Dr. Feelgood, or better than Kickstart My Heart, or some of these other epic things that Vince did with the band? Well, I just think Nikki's songwriting was so good that he was able to pull that chemistry together of that sound and that band. And I'm not so convinced that that, that raised the bar. His voice is better. Um, I didn't get to see him live, so I don't know what that looked like. Um, but in the end, ah, you tell me, you put in the comments section, tell me what you think. Um, because again, I wanna be fair about everything. Front man, how long they lasted, you know, and, and, and you put in the comments, you tell me what you think. Um, that's what we're here for. Please be respectful when posting. Don't bash people. Just give us, a, you know, a, 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 an honest opinion that is not too brutal or blunt. Anyway, thank you for joining me. I have a lot more of these coming your way and definitely check out my next video.